Welcome to Casual Chat Live. I am Brian Germain, and I'm going it solo tonight until you guys all uh, join me one by one. All you have to do is, uh, if you don't already have Zoom, you can go to zoom.us and uh, download the software for free. And then you can click on the, uh, the meeting invite, uh, which is uh, on my Facebook. And you'll be able to uh, join the session and converse and you know, do whatever you want uh, in terms of questions, conversations, um, suggestions for topics. We also, there's a question and answer window um, that you guys can utilize. There's also a chat room if you want to chatter away text-wise. Uh, I think that, that uh, that's sort of a fun feature. I noticed that you know, as I'm talking with a guest or rambling on, <laughs> on my own, uh, I can see people you know, sort of mentioning that uh, they like something or evolving an idea, and I think that's great. Um, now, the, the, the purpose of, of casual chat um, is pretty simple. Basically, uh, I want to reach out to the world, the skydiving community and beyond, the adventure community, and uh, in, in my experience, everybody's part of the adventure community, uh, and talk about uh, human expansion, all of that. Yeah, so that's not just uh, your improvement as a, as a skydiver. Skill is a part of that. Safety is a part of all of that. Awareness is part of that. Uh, but you know, as a human being, we're all evolving, and uh, in part of that is about fear, isn't it? It's not the only thing that holds people back. Uh, beliefs are part of that, and in my estimation, my, my cosmology, um, our fear tends to come from a sense of powerlessness, which often comes from our, uh, <clears throat> you know, our, our belief uh, that, that we can't protect ourselves, that we don't know enough, that the, the world is, is too big and too powerful for us to, uh, to sort of make our way through and, and, and to uh, take a concept that we've created in our minds through our own passion and make it occur, right? The act of creation is what this whole experience is about in my life, to, to experience life, but not just life as it is out there, life as we wish it to be, and then create that in the world. And if you feel like you can't do that, and you feel like the world is, is handing you a script to read off of, um, it creates a sense of helplessness, and it seems to me that a lot of people are stuck in that. Um, and so, uh, to me, the, the purpose of adventure uh, as a whole is a, a metaphor, yeah, for other things, but it's also a, a testing ground uh, that if we can, can put ourselves into what I call the hot kitchen, right, where you're, you're afraid you're questioning your abilities, you're reaching out for knowledge and uh, skill, and putting ourselves to the test, right? And in this moment where we have to be wide awake, right, in, in the now, as it were, uh, where if we don't pay attention, if we don't try our best, we can find ourselves uh, fairly uh, overwhelmed and cause our fearful visualizations, in other words, what we don't want to see happen, uh, we cause them to come true often. And at the very least, if for whatever reason uh, our worst fears don't come true, we're certainly not living the best case scenario. And so the, the best case scenario, of course, is the one that you've created in your mind uh, it, as, as a joyful expression of who you really are, right? And that is, uh, you know, for me, the, the perfect example is you get into an airplane with a parachute on your back with a plan, and maybe the plan is just to play, you know, to, to just explore flight, explore what you can do, explore, explore the massive expanse of the sky and go wherever you want to go. Uh, and, and to do that with full awareness is an amazing experience. And, and fear, we think of it uh, at first glance as well. Fear is, a, is awareness. That's why I'm, I'm scared is because I'm aware of the danger. 
I'd say, well, no, you're aware of your visualization of what might go wrong. And that is not awareness of the present moment because it's not actually happening right now, is it? The worst case scenario is not playing out. And when it is playing out, to me, that's, that's not what fear is. That's intense focus on the present moment and solving whatever comes up. And of course, you can interpret it as, uh, as a, uh, a catastrophe, right? Parachute malfunction or bad spot where you look down and go, ah, I don't know where I am. Is it really a catastrophe or is it just an opportunity for you to show yourself who you really are? You know, when you land off, I think that's such a, a, a wonderful metaphor, an opportunity to, to take a deep breath, calm yourself down, sort of let go of the conclusion that you're screwed <laughs> and look for answers, right? Look for wind line, look for, for spaces beneath you that, uh, that have clean airflow and flat ground and set up a beautiful pattern for that based on, on the site picture, based on your understanding of the performance of the parachute and where does it want to glide to and all that, keeping your airspeed up and getting a beautiful flare and touchdown uh, in, uh, in a moment where you have, you've been inventing, right? you've been creating. Uh, and, and I think that's, uh, it's fascinating. You know, one of the things that we get to do in Norway a lot, and I'm going back and I, I invite all of you to come uh, in July, we'll be there. Uh, starting the, uh, I believe it's the fourth, we're going to be in Opdal, uh, where there's a great boogie. And we do in-hops uh, at, uh, at Opdal. We do in-hops uh, in Voss, where I'm going to be the following, uh, I guess it's the, the 15th and 16th. I'm teaching a course there. I'll be there for a few more days. We do in-hops, which means you jump in to some place that you've never been. Uh, in fact, uh, I know the, way it, the way it works in Voss uh, Evan has found a place that he deems acceptable. Uh, you might not if you drove with him out in the car to, to scope it out, but he, he kind of he is pretty good at, at noticing what, uh, what people can do and what they can't do. And oftentimes we've got a license people on the job and people manage to do it. People manage to, uh, to uh, pull it together as it were. And it doesn't mean you're not scared. You know, you're, you're definitely feeling a lot of adrenaline and your heart is pumping and you're all excited about this whole experience, but you're also, um, you know, I would call it psyched. I mean, psyched is not without adrenaline, right? I mean, that's the, the, the basis of it, of it. You focus on it, your attention, you focus on, um, uh, on where you want to go. And when you realize, okay, you know where the landing area is, you see the T, so you know where you're going to land and what direction you're going to land. You've already established with the group, okay, we're going to do a left-hand traffic pattern or whatever, you know, agree upon that. You've got to take that deep breath. Go, all right, I'm in an unknown situation, but I've now I know some things where I can feel powerful. And then you realize that, that, that your parachute is, is an opportunity, you know, this wing over your head gives you the freedom to go where you want to go. And uh, you now that you know where you want to go and you, you already uh, have a sense of the winds because maybe you faced into the wind, you did, did a, a ground speed check, uh, your penetration check, some people call it. Maybe you just notice as you're flying around, wow, in this direction, I'm moving pretty fast. All right, so stay up wind. You got some some uh, wind to contend with. Doesn't mean you're gonna you need to freak out. Just means you just stay on the uphill side of it, as were. And uh, and once you you get that, you play. You know, you look around and you go, "Wow, this is this is incredible! Look where I am!" And that is uh, ah, there's nothing quite like that. I mean, jumping onto a drop zone that you've jumped to jump on, jumped onto or above. Uh, many, many times before, that's great. And that's where you hone your skills. But I urge people, uh, once your skills are, you know, your canopy flight skills are, are to the point where uh, you can trust yourself, at least, you know, I mean, obviously there's limits to, to how far you can trust yourself. Your actual skill is something that you have to, to figure out, but you figure it out in the gray zone right? You don't just go and do the same old, same old and go, well, I know how to do that. You know, I know how to do a 270. I know how to do a basic pattern. I can land more or less on a target and, you know, not hit the trees. I'm good enough. 
but you have to push your barrier. You have to call your pocket, uh, like in pool, and try hard to do something that's a, a little bit more specific. You know, you say, all right, well, normally I land in this field, but this time I'm going to land on this side of the field. I'm going to put a target out there. Next time I'm going to put a target in a different place, you know, on your drop zone. And you start pushing yourself little by little into these gray zones of, I don't know if I can. It's, it's a new feeling. It's a new visual, right? A new sight picture. And you earn your trust. And as you continue to earn your trust in, in, in your canopy flight skills and, and, of course, in your ability to calm down, even though you might be freaking out a little bit at first, right? The long, slow exhale. Something happens in you, right? And, and I know that all of you have, have been there one way or another. You've managed to... Um, to, to put it together emotionally, cognitively, in terms of your understanding of it, you know, the left brain, the, the physics, the math, the, the mechanics of your parachute, all that stuff, and you just put it to, put, put it to good use, put that, that self-trust and that understanding to good use. And to me, this is, this is uh, the human experience, right, of going into the undiscovered place and expanding, right, to, to demonstrate that you're you're not a moron you know skydivers are, are smart people it's one of the things that i've noticed in our sport is that we tend to dumb down the training a little bit and then later on you go oh gosh you know they look at all these crazy people with their 150s and 135s they don't belong on them you know they bought a parachute that's too small and they're zinging around the pattern well first of all i think we should be teaching them more and as we teach i think that we shouldn't be watering it down so much because skydivers are smart and you go, well, mm, but they, you don't want to overload them to the point where they are, you know, freaking out and, and not accessing anything that they, you know, the basic stuff, you know, you tell them too much under canopy in a too short period of time, you know, this is what I want you to do under canopy. And then they forget to the flare, you know, the most important thing, uh, I think pulling and flaring, right. It comes down to that. Um, that falls apart. It's true, but it means we just, we have to spread, spread it out over time. Take this in piece by piece, but don't dumb down the process of, 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 of teaching something so elaborate, something so important um, as, as skydiving or anything else that you happen to be doing. You know, trust your students. And if you're the student, trust yourself and, and, and pursue knowledge, pursue uh, as much as you possibly can so that you understand um, you know, that, that you have more to you than your inner critic has been stating, right? That part of you that is, that is going, eh, but I, I've screwed this up. You know, you got a list of, of, of woes, you know, that I, I made mistakes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's true. But that's you finding the path, right? How do you make the entry gate in a swoop course? How do you find your way to the perfect path to the target? We don't have to do crazy S turns and sachets and wild breaking maneuvers in traffic uh, where you, you get there easily. Well, normally you don't get there the first jump of the day, right? The first jump on a new canopy, you don't get it the first time. This is human nature. Is This is the nature of being on the earth plane is you figure things out through your experience, through being a little bit off the mark, and then you go, okay, a little to the left, right? A little up, a little down, and you dial this in a little faster, a little slower, a little more breathing, right? Waking up. Uh, all parts of the body in this moment. All of that comes together through failure, which is not really a mistake. It's just you sort of figuring out how to get you know, to where you want to go. If you're walking around in a dark room where you can't see anything at all, is it really failure when you don't grab the doorknob the first time? No, you find the wall and you work your way over and then you find the doorknob, <laughs> right? And you let the light in. Uh, this is life. So don't beat yourself up. And the ego wants, you know, the inner critic, it wants to go, oh, but that's the truth. I suck. You know, <laughs> everybody has that. So how do we let that go so that we can uh, allow ourselves a greater feeling of power, which will allow us a greater feeling of freedom to take on the bigger challenges where we have the wow moments. You know, we're like, look where I am. Look where, where my skill got me, right? My mountaineering skill gets me to some amazing places. My kayak gets me to 
incredible places. My skis where I'm, you know, go off piste or I, you know, I go into the, into the, into the trees and, and explore a little bit, or I go off into the side where most people don't ski and I, and I push boundaries. And I think that that's the nature of adventure. So um, it looks like we do have a, a visitor here. Um, Gary is here. Um, Gary, I can see you in chat. If you want me to put you on camera, we can discuss specific things. And then as other guests join, they can do that. But um, you can open up on the, Gary, if you go to the bottom, you can, there's a chat window, you can pop on there and you can give me a yes or a no if you want to go on camera and discuss stuff. Um, if not, that's fine too. Um, you can also just uh, post a question anywhere on there. And uh, <clears throat> we'll, uh, we'll see where this goes. I'm going to also double check my Facebook feed and see if there's uh, any, um, any stuff going on there. Let's see. Hi, Brian from Karen. <laughs> Big hair rocks. That's awesome. Um, so, all right. So anyway, so, I mean, if you guys are chiming in on the uh, Facebook feed, well, join me in the, the uh, chat. So if you just, um, uh, if you join the, the Zoom session, so if you, there, you can click on the link, add, add Zoom to your computer, it's a free download, and then we can converse more directly. Um, but I'm not going to put anybody on the air, as it were, unless you say, okay. Um, so I'm good right now. So I'm, I'll see, there's that I'm good thing. So I don't know what I'm good means. My kids say it to me all the time. Do you want some broccoli? No, I'm good. Does that mean yes or no? You know, if you're good, you're being a good boy, then you'll eat your broccoli. <laughs> so Gary, you might want to put on a little bit more than that. So if you would like, if you're good to go, if that's what you mean, I'll, I'll, I can make you, uh, uh, I can make you a panelist so we can uh, discuss specific things. Um, so Gary, I'm looking in the chat for your response. Otherwise, I'm just going to continue pontificating <laughs> as I do. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. While well, we have a moment, I'm going to do the most important safety thing of all. Hydrate or lose your brain. Yeah, but people uh, sometimes say, you know, I, I watched your uh, one of your instructional videos on adventure wisdom, and it was great. But man, you drink a lot of water when you're teaching. You bet your ass I do, uh, because when you're in in you know high energy states, you're going to go through a lot of it. You're thinking about it, your body's an electrical circuit. It requires water, it requires salt, it requires uh, you know reasonable levels of, of nutrition to keep you moving, right? Glucose levels and things like that. Um, okay. So, oh, so Gary was saying, I don't have any questions at this moment. Okay. So that's what he means by I'm good. <laughs> See, you have to clarify with people. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's kind of fun because I can actually see live how many people are, are watching right now. Wow. So, um, there's some other, I think, important topics, um, that, that I've been sort of noticing um, that need to be addressed um, because I mean, I, I find myself coming full circle back to, uh, to safety, right? So I do the, this uh, subset show, if you will, on Skydive Radio called Safety First. And so to me, this is a part of Safety First. Yeah, so um, I get questions, listener questions, and in this case, you know, it could be viewer questions if you guys uh, add some in here. Um, but a couple of the things that, that, that have been showing up a lot is people downsizing too soon, people putting cameras on their head too soon, they're flying in a wingsuit too soon, right? So these are very, very common things. Um, and, and then you have this other camp that looks at all those people, because often those are the same people, or at least the same kind of people that have a very high level of inner trust, a high level of passion, and they're, they're not going to be dissuaded from uh, the opinions of others. And so there's a, a deep sanity to that, right? That's, you know, adventure full on. Problem is if you run uh, at, at a 10, you know, on a scale from one to 10 in terms of your risk taking, 
um, you have an amazing life right up until you're dead, and that's usually not at an old age. Um, and so that crowd loses people. There's a high level of attrition. And then there's the other crowd, which I think overall you're talking about uh, well more than 50% of, of the skydivers, the adventure community, or take all of these risks as, as you know, sort of life risks that people take. It doesn't have to be a physical risk. Life is an adventure, right? Walking up to that person that you really got a crush on and actually engaging them in a conversation, your heart's beating like this. Uh, that's not so easy to do. And it's a risk that if, if it works, you get to live in your dream, right? You get to live in that reality of, uh, of an expanded version of you, right? If you're always on the bench, as it were, you know, you're, you're watching the people that are taking the risks and you're, you're not going to be the one that goes first. You're not going to be the one that, that, that tries the new canopy or buys the new, you know, the new canopy or wingsuit or whatever it is. Um, there is a sanity to that as well, right? I mean, those people often will, will live longer. Um, the first thing I've noticed is they don't always live longer, right? So you take that, you know, think of, of both ends of these, this cosmology is you know, kind of a spectrum. Too conservative tends to run into a number of, of catastrophes. If you're too careful, if, you're, if, you, if you take that and go all the way to timid, right, which is to me, that's fear driven, right? And the, the catastrophes you see there is not being aggressive enough, right? I see people under canopy where they're coming in for a landing, the parachute hits a bounce and turns or, or starts to sort of uh, forward surge and drop out of the sky a little bit. And, and they don't react because they're flying like this. You know, the, the fist around the toggles is a metaphor. Your entire energy is like that. And consequently, they don't respond when they need to respond. Or if they do, it's not with enough aggression that solves the problem. You spike your brakes and the parachute recovers and stops descending. If it turns off, you lean in the harness and you steer the other way, you know, with a light toggle pressure. But right now, um, you can put the parachute back on track and not go crosswind into the, you know, the picnic benches <laughs> or whatever can happen. Um, you have to sometimes be aggressive. And aggression is, is passion-based life. So the folks that are over here, and you, maybe you feel like I'm talking to you, that are, tend towards overly conservative behavior patterns and, and thought, uh, thought processes, tend to close your mind into repetitive activities, repetitive thoughts, where it's, it's, it's a known, right? It's a known quantity. It's a, it's a known experience. But reality is going to keep throwing you screwballs, right? It's going to keep throwing you something that you didn't expect. And when you're off balance uh, with this, this worldview of I'm always going to do things like a robot kind of the same way, and that's my winning formula that I always go with, you end up with accidents, broken bones, even fatalities from that, right? Not, not pulling your handles with enough aggression or not fighting the malfunction to try to fix it. So you don't even need your handles. Pulling high enough, of course, affords you the opportunity to do that. Uh, but, but sometimes the answer is to, to tap into your passion, your power, and lean into the experience. So for the folks that find themselves over on this side of it, too cautious, and, and, and none of you are going to say, yeah, I'm fear-driven. Okay, maybe a couple, but most of, most of them don't. They don't call it fear, but I would take a closer look and be honest. You don't have to tell anybody, but you might come to the realization that that some of this conservative is, is conservatism is based in kind of a fear feeling. This, you know, closed off, trying to protect, feeling unsafe, feeling slightly unpowerful. Then you have the other side, right? Do you go too far this way and you find yourself with too much passion, too much always yes, right? Always yes doesn't work. Always no doesn't always work either, right? Uh, and I know that from my own experience, always no leads to a contracted life, an uninspired life, right? Who starts new businesses, right? It's the people that say, well, let's give it a shot. Let's try it out. Life's an adventure. Let's lean into what's the worst that could happen. You know, I end up living in a tent, call it camping, <laughs> right? There's, there's, there's no real failures as long as you keep moving forward. It's like you hit a little bad air with your parachute. Keep flying forward. You'll fly out of it. 
You might have to make some adaptation maneuvers, but you have to keep moving forward to keep that parachute inflated. And when you consider your, your passion for life, your sense of power, the internal pressurization is a wonderful metaphor, right? The forward drive that causes you to feel full, that's what allows you the maneuvering capability. In the fear place, has no maneuvering capability, right? Metaphorically and literally. <laughs> the, the, the place of always flying in brakes. What does your parachute do? Oh, I'm scared because of the turbulence. I fly in brakes. If you fly in brakes the whole time, your parachute gets soft and squishy because it's low airspeed. Same thing with your life. The trouble is, if you're always full on, I always hook turn my approaches as my winning formula to, to cut through the turbulence, I might discover that the landing area is too small for that. And I got to be you know, a little bit creative and do things differently. And doing things differently is a creative process, right? So, so when we are, are filled with passion, we tend to be creative. When we're filled with fear, we tend to be close-minded, don't we? We become a little bit stupid. And it's true that on both ends of the spectrum, you can assign stupidity to the behavior patterns, right? Doing nothing when you should be doing something. Yeah, you could call that being stupid, being dumb. Like, oh, I, I should have. And afterwards, you're like, oh, why didn't I pull the handle or whatever, right? And then you have the always yes mentality, fearless, which is just a mask because everybody has fear flaring up. Just some people are better dissociating from it and ignoring it and letting their ego shout down uh, you know, the, that voice. That can often result in a whole host of other problems, can't it? But I think on a scale from one to 10, where 10 is full on and zero is full fear, aiming for, for a five is a good start, but I'm not so sure that five is the ultimate performance, the ultimate expansion of, of the human consciousness, the, the activity of the, the prefrontal cortex. It seems to me that, that the nature of the human being is that we operate more like best on like a seven or an eight. Now, everybody's a little bit different in this. Some people really want to be a watcher. They want to stand back and be careful uh, to, the, to almost to a fault. But when in doubt, they lean towards this side. And that's where they're comfortable with. And it's not my job. It's not my intention to push people too aggressively out of their comfort zone. But it is my role, it's my self-assigned role because of my realization of all this is that if, you, if I'm drawing people into the other side, right? So if you're over here at a two or a three, I want to draw you over towards that seven or an eight. And if you're at a nine or a 10 all the time, you know, sort of ignoring your fear completely and always going for it and full on passion and I'm going to, you know, burn this candle as bright as possible. Okay, maybe your life contract, you know, you, you chose to be, uh, sort of a martyr in this world and go big and then go home at the age of 25 on a base jump, you know, and die that way. You're free to do that. You know, souls come, they go, they come, they go. That's, that's fine. In, in many of the most beautiful videos we've watched are people pushing their limits. And then eventually you read about that person. And I'm sure you can think of about a hundred that died doing something like that. Maybe not that specific thing. But if that's not it, if you just are, have a little bit less self-awareness than, than you could or will about the true danger of it then, it, then I stand in the place where I'm coaxing you back you know, from the 10 and the 9 back to the 7 and the 8 in terms of your adrenaline level, in terms of your comfort level, your understanding of the situation, and always being able to you know, listen to your inner critic and listen to your passion at the same time. And we can only do that in the middle. Um, so interesting comment that I'm getting here uh, in the chat is uh, he's saying, well, I, I, I worry about things that I don't have control over, as in other people, aircraft problems, things like that. And, and yeah, I, that's, it's normal. Because if you can control it, Either, you know, you take action to reduce your risk level, to, to solve problems, to improve your situation. You know, you're, you're running out of money, so you focus on making money. That you have control over. But watching other people take a huge risk 
or other people that are in control of an aspect of your safety, like the pilot, like the guy that, you know, fuels the airplane and dips the tank and drains it and makes sure there's no water in the fuel tanks, the mechanic that, that uh, you know, is, is working on the engine. These people are you know, affecting what happens. It's true. And so then the question is, how do you stop? How do I, how do we all worry less, right, so that we can live better? Uh, because, of course, you can't control those things. So you got go or no go, right? Um, but how do we sort of expand our sense of power over, over our reality when we're not the only one that's affecting it, right? It's, it's an ebb and flow, isn't it, that, that results in safety, right? The, the pilot getting too drunk last night after you went to bed affects your safety. And here's, here's my angle on that stuff. And, and maybe it's, it's a, I guess it's a little bit spiritual, not religious, but I, my angle is I have an emotional sensation in my body. And for me, it's, it's, I feel it in here that if something isn't right, if something feels, you know, it's like I get these, the antenna, um, if I'm in a good place, a grounded place, right? In other words, I'm focused, I'm in my body, I'm sensing reality around me from, from a cognitive perspective. In other words, I'm, I'm looking at the wind velocities. I'm actually checking the wind speeds and directions so that I know what the good spot is. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the condition of the airplane. I'm listening to the engines, all that stuff. Got my seatbelt on on the way up, and when I get to my 1,500 feet, I take it off, and I'm picturing if I had to leave, who am I going to help out the door, right? Don't forget, it's not only about you. And how am I going to get the door? Am I going to go to my reserve or pitch my main? Where are we? Where would I land if we had to bail out? All that process is helping me to feel a little bit more powerful and less like a victim because victims feel fear. That's their job, right? That's their role. Job's kind of the wrong word, isn't it? I don't want to feel like a victim ever in anything. And so I realized, and I think a lot of other people have, is you call it your gut check or you know, this, this feeling, where does that come from? Where does that, the, the spidey sense that tingles, where does that come from? Does it really matter? Well, I mean, to me it does because I'm really curious about these things. But if you simply decide to trust it, trust that you've got wisdom, then you can get a sense of what might go wrong, but at the very least, you get a sense that something is off, right? You feel somebody's energy. Maybe, maybe you guys have felt this one, where you're, you're on the drops and somebody around you is moving fast, right? They've they got that frenetic energy, that sort of nervous, passionate, ah, 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 you know, all mixed up, and they're not solid. You know, they're not grounded. They don't make eye contact. They don't talk, talk soft enough to have an ebb, ebb and flow conversation that leads all of us to, uh, you know, a, a, a larger level of safety. So you take a step back from them. You know, you, you, maybe you can talk to them. Maybe you can get them to slow down. That's what I try to do is instead of just, you know, stepping back and just, you know, dissociating myself from uh, what I call the DG, right? It's the person that's, that's really out of balance and everybody knows they're likely to be the next person to get hurt or killed, right? They're the last person to know because their ego says, I don't, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to listen to you guys at all. Um, and they're not, of course, listening, listening to their own inner guidance. Otherwise, they would slow down and listen more, right? Perfect student, small mouth, big ears, right? <laughs> you know, not saying you should sit down and shut up, but listening more is how we become uh, safer, right? We learn more. So I try to get with that person. I try to sit down with them and talk to them and, and, and let my vibration, my emotional feeling uh, be contagious. In the airplane, maybe I'll put my hand on their knee. Maybe I'll, I'll talk to them and get them to slow down in their conversation. Maybe I'll introduce ideas and questions that make them think a little bit more. Because once you get people thinking, sometimes they can change. But the DG, the, the dead guy, right? he's not he's a dead man walking, right? He's a person that, you know, right now, current heading, right? it's not destiny, it's just current heading. You keep going this direction, the alignment is you're going to run out of, you know, 
breaths. That's going to be the end of that. It's possible that uh, then many of uh, many of the folks that we run into and get that feeling from, they're going to die, and that's that's what they signed up to do, maybe. But more likely, they were looking for a mentor and they didn't know it. Right? They they thought they knew it all, but to have somebody come in where they decide to honor their wisdom and they start listening. Then you get to, because otherwise you just got a bunch of ronins. You know what a ronin is, right? It's, it's, it's a masterless samurai. And we're all in the process of becoming better samurai, right? Or Jedi or whatever you want to call it, where we're, we're looking into deeper into our mind, body, and spirit to expand who we are so we can be, you know, really, really good at this stuff because it's more fun to be skillful. You can create more, you can do more, right? Um, but if you're a masterless uh, samurai, eventually your limited body of information, limited body of skill is going to exceed uh, its capabilities. You're going to find yourself wanting, right? Where suddenly the gravity says, ha, I'm bigger than you are. You know, the world says, you didn't know enough, you know, and that's the end of that. So how do I keep myself safe? I listen to my guidance, like a GPS that says, no, <laughs> don't go that way. You know, in the way that, that the, the aircraft, when you're getting low on, you know, on heavies and more complicated airplanes, it'll get a, give you a verbal cue, you know, that you've got an altitude alert, you've got a problem, you need to deal with that, add power and climb out. This is here. You have it. We all have it. And people say, well, is that really enough? Well, it's enough if you're tuned in, tapped in, and turned on. In other words, if you're calm enough and happy enough, and you go, what does that have to do with it? Well, if you're, if you're in your expanded self, you can hear your guidance from your higher self. Your higher self has a radio frequency that broad broadcasts into you. Your higher self says, that guy's going to kill himself. Currently, he's on a path to kill himself, and he's going to take some people with him. That person feels so good to me. When I'm around them, they're just smiling and happy and calm, and they're always teaching me stuff. It might not even be somebody that has you know, more jumps than you. They just have that vibe, right? I was, I was an, on, on an antenna, and I'm, I'm not uh, an active base jumper at this point, but at that point, I was standing on top of a big antenna, and some guys were going off. And this one guy, um, call him Damien, was standing on the, on, on the top of the antenna with me. And just the way he moved, the way he spoke, even up there, you know, he's got a base rig on, it's nighttime. And he's just so cool, right? That's the word, because you have hot, that's a problem. And, and then you got too cold, right? Which is tuned out, right? To me, ice cold is, is a form of fear and too hot is a form of fear. But cool right? Like the Fonz is someplace in the middle there where the brain works, where the balance in the body is present, where the skill can come out. And man, this guy, he's got it. He's, he's got that, that vibe. Your gut tells you, right? Nobody has to say, hey, that's the one you need to be listening to and learning from. There's lots of them, you know, you call them a master, right? Somebody that, that just feels right when you listen to them you have the ability to discern. You have the ability to feel your way through this dark room. It's not just uh, you floundering around in the darkness where there's a doorknob that'll get you out and there's a hot stove over here and there's a bunch of broken glass over there and you're barefoot. That's fear creates this, uh, this sense that you are incapable of protecting yourself fully. And yeah, without enough knowledge, that's kind of the scenario. But once your knowledge cup gets full enough, my experience is it's bigger than that, that we need to be listening with our ears, listening with the, the sensations from the outside, like when you're walking to the plane and you feel a gust of cold air when it was a hot day, like a really strong one, a thermal just lifted off. What's going on? You, see, you feel the wind direction shifted. That's a sensation in your body that's going to give you a cue. You feel a little bit tired. You feel like, oh, I get a little muscle spasm or whatever. Well, 
maybe, you know, if you don't do this and then maybe even sit down and chill out, heck, I take naps sometimes even on the drop zone, find your center physiologically. If you don't do that, you're going to run into a problem. So we have to be listening to our bodies. We have to be in our bodies and we have a tendency to sort of rise up out of it and go, ah, I can do anything. I'm super Superman, super woman. Well, you're not. You partially are, but you are a, an organic being with limitations, with bones that break and breaks and uh, you know, hearts that stop. So if you want to be an old skydiver, right, which is the path that I'm on and the path that I'm trying to lead, so far so good, right? Turning 50 in a couple weeks. Um, this, is, this is the game. It's about learning and listening and feeling in your body and noticing this guidance that's coming in from these places that are, you know, spooky spooky a little bit. Who cares where it's coming from, right? Maybe it's the Dead Skydivers Club talking to you, sometimes screaming, don't do this. This is dumb. Don't jump that parachute. Don't, don't jump right now. Don't jump with that guy, right? All of these things are helping to protect you. Um, and so the, the source of that stuff, uh, I think that uh, some people are, are ready to, to go into a deeper conversation about that. Others aren't ready, and that's fine. It doesn't matter. But if you trust that your gut has meaning, your gut has truth, right? Then this, this worry factor about matters that are out of your control become a little bit more in your control But because you're, you're connected to this quantum grid. You're connected in, in ways that are uh, more complicated and simple from another perspective uh, than you ever dreamed uh, imaginable from a, from a left brain, what you might call third dimensional existence, where we just were meat puppets and we're throwing our bodies at the planet and trying to miss. That's terrifying, right? Where it's, you know, it's statistics. I throw my pilot chute and my parachute statistically is going to malfunction what once every hundred, every thousand jumps, right? That's the stats according to USPA. Does that mean that on your 1,000th jump, if you haven't had a mal, you're going to have a mal? No, it doesn't, right? Ask Pip Redverse, right? 6,600 jumps, zero malfunctions, right? He did eventually have one at 6,600, but, you know, he skewed the curve, right? He's messing up the, this nice little bell curve that doesn't really exist because it's all individuals, in, individual people who have the capability to skew things, right? Just like when there's a tornado, some people get hit and some people don't. You go, well, but what about true victimhood? What about bad place at the, you know, wrong place at the wrong time? That may very well occur to a certain extent, but my belief and my experience has been validating this, is that if I'm tuned in and I'm staying in this happy place where I'm not shut down, right, where I'm not ignoring my guidance, there's less to worry about. And I can feel more confident in, in pushing my boundaries up to a point. And then where things start to get red, you know, and I feel off and my eyes are bloodshot and I ask myself the quintessential question, am I having fun? And if the answer is no, I'm actually not having fun. I'm, I'm out of my depths. I'm, I'm outside of adventure into misadventure. And that path eventually leads to physical pain right? And regret. So if I can steer myself back to center, if I can push the abort button, if I can put my seatbelt back on the airplane and ride it back down and, uh, you know, enjoy being, especially in a turbine airplane, riding back down can be a lot of fun. Yeah. I mean, you didn't even realize how, how steep they bring those suckers back down and do little zero G's, you know, uh, it's not a failure. It's a choice. And it's, an, it's you exercising your authority you know, and if you've never bailed out on a jump, you know, whether it's a skydive or a base jump, or you decided, I've done this one where you climb up a mountain, I was in a snowstorm, we're sleeping in snow caves just down from the summit. And we got, I don't know, like three feet of snow that night on Mount Hunger in Vermont. And we decided not to go for the summit. And there's a part of you that sinks and goes, oh, it's a failure. We had an objective and we didn't do that objective. But something else happens when you realize you have that switch, right? That's where power comes from, is the feeling of power, is the recognition that you can listen to your guidance, listen to your logic, and say, no, no, not today. 
it's still there. It's not a no, it's just a not, not right now, <laughs> right? I can come back. That mountaintop will be there. That door will be there for me to jump out of. That, that cliff edge will be there when I am ready, when the conditions are ready, when it all comes together, where I calm down, I sit on my butt, and I clear myself, and everything inside me says, why the hell not? That sounds like fun. Go, right? Because when you're happy, you can hear the contrast where that, you know, that thing, the discord, if you will, where everybody's playing beautiful music, right? Your whole consciousness, all the cells in your body, it's all in harmony. And all of a sudden, there's this voice that's like sour, right? Or this drum beat that's off. That is obvious to you when there's beautiful music happening. That's the voice that says something's off, don't do it, right? But if you're already in discord, if people are just banging on drums and making all kinds of noise like my kids do, you know, it's not music. Can you really tell when there's a fire alarm going off? <laughs> you can't even hear it, right? So this is why I say stay happy. Stay harmonious in your own consciousness. Stay in your body, stretching so you feel good. So that when you don't feel good, you see it, you feel it, you know it, and you take a look. Why do I not feel good? You know? Is it just my neurosis? Sometimes, right? Sometimes yeah, neurosis says, this looks like what happened in the past. And now I'm going to assign that, uh, that experience to this moment now. Is it truthfully the same moment? No, you can't repeat a moment. You can make it the same, right? And subconsciously, we often do. It's called the gutter ball. It keeps going back in the same thing. I keep landing like this. I keep flaring and tipping over. Well, you are so powerful that you can recreate your reality to a certain extent. But that's all just visualization. And the, the fear is coming from a visualization, not from a reality. Because like I said, once it's kinetic, once it's actually happening, there's no time for fear, right? There's no time for second guessing and wondering and visualizing and you know, spinning the wheel of the negative visualization and getting your panties in a bunch and your heart racing, right? You've probably been there in bed when you're worried about something, right? Every time I'm getting ready to leave for a, a month-long trip or you know, six-week or even two-month trip with my whole family with all the skydiving gear and the wingsuits and the projectors and the laptops to go on a teaching tour, we're not coming home, and I'm trying to picture how am I going to put all this luggage and I got the car seats and we need diapers and how we, you know, it's terrifying. And usually until I have it all figured out, I can't sleep very well. I lay down and my heart is racing because I still have something to do. So in those times, I sit down and plan when I'm clear enough and not all worrisome, because I can't see solutions when I'm worrisome. And when I'm so worrisome that I can't find those solutions, I sit down, right? I clear my head. I, I do Reiki on my brain, <laughs> right? Where I, I clear the thoughts out. And if I can't do it sitting uh, you know, on my meditation cushion, you know, up in my loft, I've got a, you know, a little Persian rug sitting there and, you know, sit down on my, my cushion and, and clear myself that way. Sometimes that's not sufficient. And so I got to go to the big temple, right? I go, to, I, I go to the church of nature. And I sit down and I clear myself. And sometimes I do it at night and listen to the crickets. Sometimes I do it during the day and I listen to the birds. Sometimes you do it first thing in the morning when you know the birds are chirping and you get that beautiful white light and everything's so still and nobody else is awake the worry goes away because i'm in this moment where everything around me is saturating me it's flowing into me and i find my center and once i'm in my center right where i'm feeling good then my solution of oh if i attach this luggage to that luggage and with this strap and you know if i minimize that and maybe we can take the the tent you know, so that we can go camp at high altitude in Norway with the kids or something. Maybe there's a way, but when I'm in a place of worry, I'm not seeing solutions. I'm only seeing limitations and barriers, and I'm justifying them with reasons why I can't. Why can't I start that new business? Why can't I create a TV talk show where I talk to myself and thousands of people actually end up watching it? And maybe a couple of them get inspired. Maybe. Maybe a couple of them look at it and go, that guy talks too much. <laughs> that's fine. Um, but that's your choice, uh, all of you, to, um, you know, uh, human beings have a choice about 
where, where we focus and what we're willing to settle for in terms of vibe. You know, if you have what, we're sell, what we're willing to settle for in terms of a, a sense of control over our experience, our inner experience, right? Um, I'm reminded of uh, this, a moment that keeps happening where somebody is mad and they say to the person who they attribute this angriness to, you made me so mad, right? Or you made me so scared. You freak me out, right? Do they actually have, you know, a control panel to your amygdala, to them, your hypo- hypothalamus, right? Do they have the ability to remote control affect your emotions? Or is there a bubble that you can create around yourself called the breath, right? Called the moment where you decide to walk away and lock yourself in the bathroom, Right? That's what I have to do sometimes. I mean, I got kids, right? Talk about a challenge. There's times where, where they're screaming and yelling and I'm realizing that I can't help. Right now, my, emotionally, I'm, I'm not the dad. I'm, I'm letting myself be the victim and I'm letting them work me, right? I'm letting that emotion getting inside me and I'll, I'll lock myself in the bathroom and pretend I'm using the bathroom, <laughs> You know, and they'll knock on the door. Daddy's pooping. I'm not pooping. I'm sitting on the toilet meditating. And sometimes you have to do that. And sometimes you got to walk off the drop zone and sit down in the woods because you had a malfunction and it freaked you right the hell out. That's part of this sport. Maybe you jumped uh, jumped out of the airplane with a wingsuit and got on your back and started spinning and you're having trouble. You you're all you know all out of sorts and and you feel like oh gosh if that happens again I'm you know. I might die. Well, death isn't that easy to occur for somebody who is able and willing to do these things, to to calm themselves down enough to refocus into the body and to ask the bigger questions of, is there something I can do to improve my safety? First, it's, is there something I can do to improve my feeling, right? To feel great naturally lends itself to asking that next question of what can I do to improve safety? And beyond that, what can I do to improve joy, right? The sense of freedom of flight, that's about skill. If you suck at flying, well, your experience is going to be very limiting, right? So, uh, you know, true freedom is a skill game, isn't it? But that comes from this emotional intelligence thing leading to mental clarity so that we can be a larger container for information, for awareness, right? of self and world. So there it is. So if there's, um, <clears throat> if there's any, let's see, I'm checking my other questions to see if there's anything else here in the chat. Um, and I'm going to double check here on the Facebook, see if there's any comments on the feed uh, to see if there's things that people want to um, want me to comment on. Cool. Um, so I'm not going to ramble on much longer <laughs> because uh, we're just about at the top of the hour, and I want to keep these things down to uh, down to about an hour. Uh, but uh, here's some of my thoughts about safety and expansion and the, the spiritual aspect of safety, the the emotional guidance system that we all have, but some people feel like they don't have because you know they got focused into the negativity so much that their antennas have been down for a while, um, but they're not gone, right? If you can get yourself into a calm, clear place of appreciation and of, of sort of empty clarity where you feel good enough to notice when a thought that isn't so good shows up in the darkness, right? And in, in, in my uh my visualization of this, it's quite the opposite, that we're, we're in illumination and something that is not illumination, a shadow, becomes obvious, right? So bask in the light of your own awareness. Bask in the light of your own joy. Bask in the light of your own love of the people around you, the, 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 the fellow 
uh, skydivers and uh, you know adventure people. You know, if you're if you're one of my folks from the the climbing community or the paddling community or the skiing ski racing community, it's all the same thing. We need each other, and if we can uh, sort of nurture a feeling of of mutual respect and let that lead us to uh, listing off specific things that we appreciate about other people, the, the individuals that are around us, noticing them, right? I see you. And then we can nurture a, a feeling of, of true, you know, true joy. And from that place of true, true joy, we're going to create a much higher degree of safety. And we're also going to create a higher level of creativity which is why we're here, right? I mean, I, I, you think you were born to just sort of take up space, take up resources, and then drop dead? You know, maybe amass enough wealth that you can pass that on to future generations? I think we're here for much more than that. And I believe that most of you would agree with that. So with that, I will leave you to your evening. Thank you so much for joining on, uh, on Casual Chat. And I look forward to next week where we have, if all goes well, Norman Kent joining us. So that should be a blast. So next Wednesday, I will uh, look forward to, to uh, connecting with all of you. And, uh, and after the discussions, if you do join in Zoom, uh, you can uh, talk to Norm Kent. We've been doing this now uh, where at the end of the session, we uh, allow everybody else to show up in video and in conversation. And we can all talk amongst ourselves after I stop recording. Uh, so I think that that would be, uh, that'll be a pretty cool one because Norman is, uh, he's an amazing guy. He really is on a lot of different levels. Um, and, uh, and I think you'll, you'll enjoy him as, uh, as much as I do. So again, thank you all so much for joining. Thanks for, for being who you are, for being a light in the world. Uh, it's, it's getting better because of you. All of it is. Thank you. I love skydiving, and that's why I do what I do. Silver car with a borrowed guitar, ready to travel so far. <laughs> <laughs>